Scouts, get started. Um, my name is Robert Auger. I'm with Spy Dynamics, um, security engineer there. I'm just going to do a talk about the risk associated with RSS and Atom feed um, readers. Um, in a nutshell, um, really high level overview. You can do, it's a neat little vector to do, uh, to have additional uses of cross site scripting, among other things, and I'll walk you through a few demos. So I'm going to describe what RSS and Atom feeds are the application types using them, how, what I tested, how I tested them, um, the different types of applications that utilize the feed, um, what I found, and um, some things people can do to fix it. Um, so so before, before we talk about how to attack them, here's just a review for some people who, who aren't familiar with them. Um, they're a way to share content. Um, you, you share, you, you use it for news stories, you can share uh, MP3s, movies, um, blogs will often have RSS, RSS generators built in, so like if you're posting something on your blog, it'll automatically populate that to an XML file that you can use to syndicate the content with. Um, they don't require the user necessarily to visit the site. The, kind of the point of it is that you don't have to keep visiting your favorite website. Uh, you can just subscribe to this and use a local client and it will basically fetch the headlines and a description of the story, and if you want to read it, you can. Um, and RSS and Atom are the most popular for, uh, feeds in use. There are a few other ones. Some people have done some custom ones as well. Uh, RSS by far is more popular at the moment. Here's just an example of, um, of what each feed looks like. Uh, RSS is on the left, Atom's on the right. I highlighted in blue some of the differences. Adam has some additional functionality that kind of extended the concept of RSS. You can see that they have titles and subtitles, and they added some, some, some stuff for hashing in order to help um, uh, differentiate things. Um, uh, so. Wow, you're starting. You can't, can you? Where is the RV guy? Hmm. Can uh, one of the uh, stream guys fix that? It's working over here. Well, I guess for now, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to look over there until they fix that. Uh, so basically here are examples of the two types of files. As you can see uh, in the description field, it's basically a description of the text. The link is where that text is a, a brief description of, things like that. So here's just kind of a background of RSS and Atom, uh, created by Netscape in 99, same people brought you cookies, uh, multiple versions. Uh, Atom was created by uh, Sam Ruby on his wiki, and eventually it grew out of uh, his wiki, and I moved over to the, the Atom Pub working group. Um, multiple versions of Atom, basic stuff. So sites like CNN, MSNBC, Slashdot, they all provide feeds. They, all, they, they want to attract people to their site. That they, like in other words, uh, some people want to be able to subscribe, like you're in a website like Bloglines. It's kind of a place where you can subscribe to multiple resources, and in one location you can read all of them, and you don't have to go out to all these different sites. And they're actually pretty popular. Um, some people put them on their website, they download a feed, and they utilize the feed's content and display that on their website. Some people do that for search engine optimization. So you're always getting scrolling dynamic content. So some people may subscribe to a feed with certain buzzwords that they kind of want their site to be known for, and then they'll update that every hour or five hours or whatever the time specified in the feed is. Um, once again, um, pretty much most major blogs will, will automatically have uh, RSS built into it or add them. Uh, like WordPress, as an example, automatically generate the, the feed off of user comments or off of the news stories themselves. Uh, BitTorrent, um, there are some extensions for that which allow uh, downloading lists of torrents and uh, providing sharing that way as well. So you have producers and you have consumers. The producers will create the feed and store it in an XML file or they'll have it in a database and then they'll dynamically generate it and kind of stream it over to whoever's requesting it. The consumers are obviously the things that are using them. Um, you got websites, things like that. So there's multiple different types of consumer types. You have standalone clients. Basically, they'll be like a browser or a standalone application that you'll download just for the purpose of reading feeds. 
some uh, some peer-to-peer -peer clients as well. Peer-to-peer -peer clients as well will use them. You have online readers such as blog lines or like Google Reader, things like that. Um, and one of the one of the one of the things that's starting to grow is people downloading a feed, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, provide displaying that feed's content on their own site. And in some cases, they even take that content and then put it into their own feed. So let's say, for example, that you're running a security site and you want to provide security news. Well, you may subscribe to 10 different security feeds, take their content and stick it into your feed and kind of provide your users with a rundown of everything so they don't have to subscribe to a bunch of sites. And definitely people are doing that. So I tested all, all three of the different types of client readers. Um, I tested a few popular browsers, tested the, the popular standalone uh, RSS readers and Atom readers. Uh, which I'll, I'll demonstrate a few things that I found. So one of the most important things is, okay, you can put stuff in a feed and do evil things, but you have to get it in there first, right? So you, you're in the situation where, okay, that happens if A, the feed, the, the feed uh, cre uh, can, producer is malicious. So let's say I want to hack my users for some reason. I can put something in there. It's not really going to be the most, the most popular use case. Um, Thousands of sites, hundreds of sites are, are defaced daily. What if instead of defacing the sites, they just decided to start injecting attacks into the feeds? So let's say, for example, that there's 100, 100 websites, 50 of them have feeds, and a couple thousand people are subscribed to those feeds. Rather than defacing the site and being noticed, why, why, I mean, they could just put an attack into that feed, and now they're owning all the users. So that's, that's kind of a more useful um, use case for that. Some feeds, some feeds are created from mailing lists or, or, or news entries, things like that. So let's say I post something to the, uh, let's say the web security mailing list. Um, that, somebody may grab that mail spool and then generate a feed off of that. I actually do that myself um, for that particular list. And it's possible that somebody could send a malicious, uh, an email with, some, with an evil attack in it. And if I'm not filtering when I'm converting that stuff into my feed, it's possible that that can be another attack vector as well. And it's just worth mentioning, but it's, uh, it's mostly unlikely. It's possible somebody could like proxy cache poison if there's a proxy between you and it. Just worth mentioning. It's, it's, not, like, it's not likely. So one of the first things I did was I, I tried to figure out, okay, so we have these feeds. When, originally, I started looking into it because I wanted to provide a feed on my own site, and I kind of had to learn about them. And I was basically, okay, what is the common types of, of stuff that's in that feed that people care about? You'll usually have the, the, the title of the, way, of the site providing the feed and the description of the site providing the feed. And then you'll have the individual story information, like the title, the length, the description, um, the author, um, and there's multiple other tags as well. So in a nutshell, I created a bunch of different feeds, and I kind of tested different scenarios. So I created a bunch of feeds, and I looked at all those popular common elements, and I started, um, uh, just as a smoke test, I just started trying to inject, like, script in there, like JavaScript, just to, just to do an initial smoke test. Uh, so some, some of them, um, some of the, the readers behaved differently. If I, if I injected literal script, some of them would complain. If I, if I HTML entity encoded some of the tags, like left bracket, right bracket, things like that, some of them allowed that, and, then, and some of them actually reconverted that when they presented that information. And some of, them only, some of them will only allow like the left tag to be HTML entity and the right tag. So I kind of tried various different combinations to kind of see the different types of behaviors that these applications had. So this is just an example of one of the initial uh, smoke test feeds that I had created. You can see here that um, I just tried pop-ups initially. Basic test, everybody does it. And I just tried it in all the, the popular things. On the, on the left is the RSS, on the right is Atom. You can see Atom is a little more, a little more to it. They have additional, addif additional functionality. RSS is kind of simple, hence really simple syndication. So this is the literal HTML uh, injection where I just literally just stuck it in there. And this is the HTML entity one. As you can see, instead of a left bracket, you have ampersand LT, uh, semicolon, and the corresponding tag to that. Um, XML specifies that if you have uh, certain tags, like let's say, for example, that I just had one left bracket, it says that you should be converting that to an HTML entity for storage. And actually, in this example, technically, I'm closing the script tag, so technically that's valid XML. However, I was kind of, I was kind of wondering, I'm like, well, if, I, if, they're, if they're meant to convert that, I wonder if I can just put that in there and if that'll work. So that's something that I tried. And this is just the combination example 
on the left, you can see I have the entity on the right. It's just the literal tag for that. So I tested a, so a couple of web-based readers. Uh, I basically put up a bad feed on my own site, and uh, I started subscribing to it. And traditionally, the literal tag injection is what worked, because the online readers, aren't, they don't really convert the HTML entities to the, to the tags before displaying them. The ones that I tested pretty much just took it literally. So, so some of the things that you can do, common cross-site scripting stuff for like the web-based readers, you can steal cookies. Uh, here's an example of, of the code below that would um, send your cookie off to another site. So one of, one of the things that's really starting to pick up this year that people are starting to talk about is cross-site request forgery. In a nutshell, you're kind of, if you're logged into, let's say, a bank, the bank knows that if you send a request to that bank, the bank knows um, only it it, it, it it receives a request, and as far as it's concerned, you're initiating it. Let's say, for example, that I'm logged into my bank, and on another site, I'm logged into another site, and in that site, they have an image source tag. In that image source tag, it contains a command for the bank that I'm logged into. Mind you, I have to be logged into it for it to be of any use. But if I'm logged in and I view that other site, my browser is now going to send a request to that bank. As far as the bank's concerned, I'm logged in. I'm sending a legitimate request. For some of these web-based readers, so this is another thing that you can do with, with, um, with I mean, common, common web-based attacks and injecting this into a web feed. For some of the web-based readers, you could also perform this as well. Now, the context of the vulnerability, for the most part, is within the same site zone. In other words, you can't, you can't when, I, when I put an attack into a feed, and I, I viewed that feed on the web-based reader, and that web-based reader was vulnerable, I couldn't start taking cookies from other sites because of browser restrictions. I was pretty much locked into the site that I was looking at. However, I still could do things like cross-site request forgery. And actually, uh, there's a few more interesting things involving um, JavaScript port scanning. Um, that I'll briefly touch, and actually Billy Hoffman will be talking about later, and Jeremiah Grossman. Um, so even when you're locked into the current site that you're on, there are some additional things that you can do. One of the other things that you can do is, if I'm viewing that web-based uh, feed on, let's say, like blog lines as an example, if they inject something, they can actually record keystrokes. So let's say, for example, that I'm viewing a feed, and let's say that there's like a search engine or there's something else on that same site. If I'm currently viewing that feed, the JavaScript within there has the ability to log the keystrokes, and anything that I'm typing, as I'm typing it, it's sending off a character off to a remote host, and I'll actually demonstrate that in a bit. So how practical is it? Um, Bloglines is one of the first people that I I'd smoke tested. Um, I actually used a slightly different feed than the one I had uh, in the example here. In a nutshell, I, I initially was smoke testing it, and it broke, like all the, all the HTML broke. So I kind of, I knew something was there, I just kind of had to tinker around a bit. So in a nutshell, after a lot of tinkering, I started doing uh, the on mouse over attribute. And I noticed that when I did that, they converted it to no mouse over. So they were actually looking for it actively and then flopping it around. So I just capitalized the first letter and I got around the filter that way. So that's a, that's a classic example of uh, only allowing, rather than, rather than trying to filter very specific things, you should really just be allowing certain things. Other big websites as well have had some issues. There was an issue last year that Yahoo had in their RSS reader online. Google just had an issue this month. I think it was about three weeks ago. Um, Arsenic had found an issue where he, he actually created the feed, um, and in the link tag, he had just done a pop-up to, to initially smoke test it, and they were affected as well. When I initially smoked, I actually initially smoke tested Google Reader, and I forgot to put it in there. <laughs> so. So I tested a bunch of local readers. An example of local readers, there's, there's actually an application, people have heard of like a feed daemon or, or sharp reader or RSS reader is actually, if you type RSS reader into Google, there's actually an application called RSS reader that's number one. Um, a lot of them used browser components. A lot of them essentially used IE to render the feed because it was just easy to deal with and a lot of people actually went that route. So the entity injection, a lot of the times they download the feed and when I created a feed that had 
um, HTML entities instead of the literal tags, they would convert that, and then they would take that data, and then they'd shoot that into the browser view, and they didn't take into consideration some of the things that may be in there. Different readers had different context. Like one of the, like RSS reader, which is the name of it, which I'll, I'll demo in a, shortly, that particular application downloaded the feed, took the data out of the feed, saved it to an HTML file in the file system, and then they loaded that into IE, which now you're in the local zone. So now you can do things like uh, access ActiveX objects to like copy files off to remote hosts, um, do some other evil things. Now, the remote zone doesn't have access to the file system intentionally. Usually it'll be like a browser bug which will allow that to happen. It's pretty much you can only do things to the existing site that you're on. You can't access things on the file system because, because of the security restrictions that people have agreed upon with the different types of browsers. Now, because specifically with like cross-site request forgery, let's say that I'm, let's say that I have my local reader and I download a feed. And in that feed I have um, either JavaScript or image source tag that will send a request to an off-site host. It's possible that an attacker could provide a URL that's actually an attack against another site. So as an example, maybe if you hit a certain URL, the site acts slowly. So what they do, they stick it in their feed, and everybody who downloads that feed, so now you maybe got between you know, 100 or 5,000 people, or even more if it's like Slashdot or something like that. And every single time people view these feeds that have a vulnerable client, they're all hitting this site. So you kind of have a distributed method in order to kind of relay attacks um, to other sites. Now there is a potential for web form spam for this. A lot of, a lot of uh, technologies like, like CGI.PM module, basically the developer will be able to just say, give me a parameter. And it doesn't, you, they don't have to specify, get me the parameter from get or get me the parameter from post. In other words, a lot of forms online will have, will, you, you use post in order to submit the data. However, you could convert that to get and send a request to that to that remote site. So it's possible that let's say that there's a let's say there's an online forum or let's say that there's a web forum for somebody that you don't like. You could you could inject something into the feed and everybody who's now viewing it is now sending email to this person and kind of overloading them. Another thing that you can do in the local zone is with XML HTTP which uh, commonly people will refer that with Ajax. Um, you pretty much, when you're viewing your current site, you're pretty much locked into sending requests to that current site, but when you're loading it off of the local file system, there is no restriction. So in a nutshell, if I download a feed and I'm in a local zone, it can now port scan my entire network. Possibly relay attacks, things like that. So I'm gonna do a demonstration here of, um, with RSS Reader, which is the name of the application. And this is a little piece of JavaScript that will read a file uh, test.txt for my local uh, C root, and then it'll copy it off to a remote host as a parameter. Now, this isn't optimized. I didn't base 64 the file or anything like that. This is just kind of to show you that, it, that you can forward it along. Now, obviously, you're not going to subscribe to a feed that's already vulnerable. You're going to subscribe to a feed, and more than likely, something's going to happen to it that will then relay attack. So I'm just going to kind of subscribe to a feed here that's innocent. So this is a good feed, talking about drinking beer at DEF CON. So if I'm interested, I could, you know, I could read more about that. But unfortunately, there's no free beer at DEF CON, so that's not going to happen. So let's say I'm subscribed to this feed, you know, it's a couple months later. The site owner's not malicious, but something happens so that either somebody hacks the machine or perhaps this feed is actually from a, a blog or something like that and a user has posted a malicious comment which has gotten into the feed. Um, so right now, normal feed, everything's good. So I'm just kind of, kind of simulate somebody injecting an attack. I'm just going to update this. So let's just pretend that it's like a month or two has passed by. I'm just going to, this will periodically pull like every 10, 10 hours or 15 hours and some feeds like Adam um, allow you to specify how often it should be pulled. So just for the context of this, I'm just going to kind of force an update. So let's say that I'm, you know, oh, this is an interesting news story here. People are familiar with this. Yes, it's an ActiveX warning. Yes, it's not automatically executing it. However, people open email attachments all the time and we still have email viruses, right? I'm a clueless user. I just, you know, I subscribe to CNN or something like that. Not that CNN is vulnerable or anything like that, but uh, I'm a normal user. I don't know what this means. I'm just going to click yes. 
just like when I open up an attachment, I click yes, and we have all these stupid email viruses roaming around. So as far as I'm concerned, nothing happened. But however, what actually happened was is that, that you read that file off the local file system, and then it sent it off to a remote host here. And you can see here it says, this is the text within, uh, within text.txt. And this is, a, this is a remote host that this got forwarded off to. You can kind of see the potential here. And actually, this particular client, when you, when you first boot up your machine, it will, it will load the, it'll load RSS reader upon start, and it will automatically present them with it before they even view the application. So as soon as the machine boots up, all they see is this warning, and they're going to click yes, because they're not going to understand what the context of it is, because users just don't know. So just in case the demo didn't work for some reason, I took a screenshot of it because that happens. Um, and again, this is kind of the log entry. This is the Apache log entry of what, that, what the context of that file was. Here, now, I'm not going to get too much into the, in, in regards to using XML HTTP to port scan backend networks. There's two talks today that are going to talk about that. And I don't really want to get into it, to be honest with you. But I just put an example of just a basic, sending a basic request off to a site. And here's, a, here's kind of a diagram. Um, first time I used Visio, so it's not too great. But in a nutshell, you, you, the, the user would be downloading the feed. Obviously, they'd be downloading it from within their corporate network, which would, they'd be able to get around that firewall because they're the one initiating it, so it's cool. The feed could contain JavaScript or VBScript, depending on the reader, because a lot of readers will use IE components, so they'd be able to do VBScript as well. And if somebody were to, if somebody were to create JavaScript to kind of try to port scan the backend network, it would, in fact, work. And, and this is something that had been tested, actually, at the office. So you can see here that. Um, the user's machine is the one that's performing the scanning. And, it's, and then they would be forwarding that off to an attacker. And it's possible they could get additional instructions like, oh, I found a web server. OK, it's this web server. Oh, OK, um, here's an attack payload for that. And this could be totally transparent to the user where they wouldn't know that they're actually attacking their backend network just because they subscribe to some user blog feed. So website feed usage. This is actually a, a screenshot of the, of the web security mailing list feed. A lot of people, again, will, 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 they will download a feed from another site, and then they will provide that on their own in order, in order to do scrolling news, things like that. And they may not take into consideration the content within that. Once again, if I inject script into there, and they're not, they're not looking at some of the data, now that script's on their site. Everybody viewing that site now has that script. And some of the things that you can do with it is, uh, you know, again, common, you know, cross server cross origin cookie theft. You can also do keystroke logging, and that really, that really will only work on the same exact page that that's displayed. Excuse me. However, there are some sites that will display the feed on every single page in order for the, in order to, to SEO boost their site, search engine optimization their site. And actually, I put it on every page of my site, so I just kind of copied my site as an example here. And if it's on every single page and it, contain that, it contains the key logging JavaScript, anything you type in on any single page, including your logging in or you're searching for something on the site, every one of those things that you're doing will be recorded by an attacker, potentially. So I'm not going to get into names of any specific sites, but there was one notable site that actually had downloaded a feed from um, a resource that I know of. And they took that feed and they put it on their website, and they filtered it on their website, but they also put it into their own feed. But they didn't take into consideration that they may be relaying attacks. And the people, the user base of that particular website was rather large in the thousands easily for that particular feed. So it's actually a lot of people aren't, even people, and this is actually a security site. I'm not going to name it uh, to be PC, but um, it happens to everybody. People just aren't taking into consideration where data is necessarily coming from before they're starting to use it. Actually, I'm, one, one thing I forgot to mention on the previous slide is that you may download the feed, put it in your own feed. Somebody may download your feed put it into their feed and kind of keep doing that process. And suddenly, 
an attacker injects something into a feed and suddenly now potentially hundreds of websites, depending on how popular the feed is, of course, are now potentially um, relaying that attack for them. This is kind of an overview of all the different client types that were tested. A lot of them complained about literal tag injection, which was nice. However, um, the web-based readers, of course, were the primary people focused by that. The local readers, like a RSS reader or some of the other local clients that you would download, pretty much they were all affected by converting the HTML entities to, a, to HTML. And that's okay, however, when they presented that information through a, a browser component, it executed. And they didn't really take into consideration potentially disabling script execution when they're using that IE component or disabling applets or disabling other plugins and things like that. So here are some products affected. There's actually some more, but I'm currently working with a, with a bunch of vendors, and I just want to respect them to, to allow them to fix this problem. So blog lines obviously was affected. RSS reader, which again, you Google RSS reader, and it's the number one reader. Uh, RSS Owl, I actually, I'd, I'd spoken with that person in email, and they're not going to fix it, but they do have a workaround in order to disable in the settings the, the script execution, but they're not going to do it by default. Uh, because one of, one of the things to take into consideration is that some websites like Yahoo actually make a business on putting ads into an RSS feed. So basically, if I, if I run a blog or something, I can make money by putting a little piece of JavaScript in my feed when it gets generated. And that, that, that will be displayed to anybody um, who has this feed, and I can make money whenever they click on it. So some, pe some people are, I mean, it's, 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 okay. it's good and it's, it's bad functionality, depending on where you're going from. Some people are specifically counting on JavaScript execution to be there uh, in, order to, in order to function. So practical use case, uh, I'm Mr. Evil, and I post something to a blog. Let's say... Like, or a website, maybe like Slashdot or some forum or something like that. And maybe when, they, maybe when they present my post on the website, they're filtering it, but they're just putting it literally into the feed. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a demo in a moment regarding the, the keystroke logging, but, excuse me one moment. As far as what an attacker would actually use this for, attackers want to either get botnets or they want to steal something from you, usually. Definitely, what's your, the type of site that you're on, depending on, if it, depending on the type of site that's, that's, that you have the, the viewer on or the type of viewer that you have, they may want to take information from you, such as like credentials, things like that. So, as I, as I previously had mentioned, some sites displayed on every single site. This is actually just a screenshot of my site. And on every single page, I have two feeds. I have a security focus feed and I have the web security mailing list feed. So no matter where I am, it's always there. Luckily, I filter it. If I didn't, I'd have a problem. Um, and I'm just going to kind of walk through the, the demo of that now. So this is just a copy of my site here. So let's just say uh, I'm a Joe user. I go to the site. Uh, very interesting. There's all kinds of stuff here. That's great. So let's say I have an account, um, and I'll just, I'll just log in. That's great. Now I'm logged in, and now I know my, my favorite link now. But what really happened was that while I was typing all of that, everything I just typed was actually copied off to a third-party host as I was typing it. And if you can see right here, everything I just typed in. So I typed in foo as my, as my username, and I typed in bar. I, I did actually fat finger and typed two r's. So you can see as I'm, as I'm entering in each key, it's being sent off to that remote host without my knowledge as far as I'm a basic user. You can actually see if you look very quickly. If you look very quickly in the, on the bottom left-hand corner, you can kind of see it flashing, and you can, you can see that it's actually sending it off. However, that's not something that a user is going to pay attention to. They're just going to type, do their thing. They don't look at things like that. So here's kind of, I guess, 
kind of what I was talking about. Here are the different types of ways that that feed can be resyndicated on different sites and kind of propagate an attack. Either A, server A has the malicious feed. People subscribe to the malicious feed on, on server A are attacked. Or server B downloads it, and then they, then they provide content on their site and display it. Now you're affecting that user base. Or perhaps they're putting it into their own feed, and now everybody subscribed to that is now affected. And now perhaps server C is downloading server B's feed and kind of repeating that process over and over again. So you can kind of see the potential here for kind of widespread issues. So this is, a, this is kind of a little bit of a debate because the, the, the web-based feed standards, they allow HTML formatting. If I want to put like, if I want to like bold a certain, if I want to bold like a certain thing of text or put like an href in there, they support it. There's nothing wrong with it. But you're, you're, you're kind of, you kind of have to make a decision. Do you want to, do you want to, do you want to present this information and potentially have a few risks associated with it? Or do you want to strip it out and make it not as usable? Obviously, one of the basic suggestions would be to disable, to disable script applets or plugins like Flash, things like that. But if you still allow HTML, there's still a potential to do the cross-site request forging attacks. Sure, it's not like the coolest attack ever that you can do necessarily, but there are definitely risks if you're logged into like a stock trading site or something like that. You figure, let's say, let's say for example, that I know I can influence a feed that has 50,000 users subscribed, right? If I, if I inject an attack in there, I figure, okay, it's a big bank. Maybe, maybe, maybe uh, at least two or three of those users are going to be logged into there while they're reading it. So I might be able to like transfer funds to another account of mine, or perhaps if it's like an online um, store, I might be able to have them buy something, perhaps. So one of the, I mean, obviously the best way to deal with this, you can either, you can either a disable the script stuff and allow HTML and still have issues with cross site request forging, or b you can allow it. And as an example, Yahoo has the ability to do JavaScript-based advertising. But then if you're, if, if, you're allowing, if you're allowing your reader to execute that, now you're opening yourself up to those other risks. Definitely one of the better things that you can do is actually something that a lot of online forums have done. They kind of allow certain HTML tags, as an example, like links. Um, or a lot of them will create like pseudo links where you'll have like a bracket, URL bracket, and you'll put it in there, like PHPBB and some other ones do things like that. So that's, that's another option that you can do. Anybody have any questions so far? Okay. So there's actually a lot of things that can be done. I kind of just, this is kind of an introduction to some of the threats that can be associated with web-based feeds and the different use case scenarios with them. But there are definitely some other interesting things that can be done. A lot of podcasting clients or peer-to-peer -peer clients will automatically download the files. Adam has the ability to specify a file to be downloaded, and it actually has a few uh, attributes that you can specify content types. So that's, that's kind of something, the, the MIME type rather, that's something I'm kind of interested in looking into. Some, some embedded devices will actually use them to update themselves. So let's say, for example, um, actually TiVo has, um, they have a, a reader that you can install on there. So imagine if TiVo, not that they are vulnerable, I haven't tested them, and I'm not going to say that they are or they aren't. But let's say that TiVo is affected. Let's say that TiVo did like an update to TiVo Home in order to do updates for itself. What if I could somehow influence that feed, or maybe I poison the cache in between, and what if it downloaded that and was vulnerable? A lot of people have TiVo. So you can kind of see the potential here that this isn't just a web browser or a local reader. This can potentially affect embedded devices as well, depending on how they're utilizing them. Ad spamming. Like I said, Yahoo has the ability to do, to do ads. Definitely there might be a potential that people are going to start abusing this where they may, they may find websites that will display uh, like a post or something like that that also has a feed. And on the websites, they are filtering it, but not in the feed. So like a lot of people are familiar with, I'm sure a lot of the people here have, um, have web-based forms and get all these bots hitting them with like inserting all these, these crappy links in order to boost up their sites. Um, that's definitely going to happen. Yeah, it's going to happen um, more than likely on blogs and things like that. These are kind of automated tools that just scrape the web, find any form, and start submitting things to it. Um, and definitely that data has the potential to be put into a feed. And then now that feed could be on another site. And now suddenly the site that they're spamming to SEO boost is now displayed on another site. So now they have that other site's page rank helping them boost their site up. I didn't review every single uh, element. There's a lot of them. I didn't have enough time. It's kind of out of scope for this talk. Uh, but definitely there's a lot of interesting things in there. 
And uh, if anybody's actually done any research with that, I'd be interested to talk to you guys about it. Here's just some additional references. Um, I just released a paper on Tuesday kind of outlining some of the things in this talk. It's about 20 pages or so. Kind of uh, walks you through the types of things that, that can happen. Um, introduction type paper to the type of issue. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna preach to the choir here. You gotta whenever you get data, you can't assume that that data is good if you're gonna use it. You have to consider, okay, I'm getting data from here. What am I doing with that data? How where's that data going? How could the impact of where that data is going potentially create a risk? Um, it's possible that you have application A storing it, application B is taking it out of that storage and using it. You need to no matter where the data is coming from, you need to you need to you need to take into consideration the risks that could happen with that. Um, and as this year, this is basically the cross-site scripting room this year at Black Hat. <laughs> and uh, it's starting to become more useful. About three or four years ago, pretty much anybody who looked at it and wrote anything on it were, were considered lame. We're less lame now, I guess. But uh, there's some more interesting things that you can do. And there's, there's a lot of talks today that are, are going to be pretty interesting. Um, again, Jeremiah Grossman, Billy Hoffman, there's some other talks today. They're going to kind of get into the port scanning aspect and some of the other kind of extended uses for it that you can do. So does, that, does anybody have any questions or? Um, well, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of online forums do have that issue. That was kind of out of the scope. I did notice that some of them would relay the literal script into their feed as an example. Technically, there's nothing wrong with that because the spec allows tags to be in there. Um, and a lot of the times, like if they've done a post with HTML entities or something like that, and they're storing that in the feed, technically there's nothing wrong with that. However, it's the person using it. So kind of that website is kind of relaying something um, off, to, off to another type of client in order to attack it. So to answer, to answer that question, um, A, no, I didn't test specifically what online bulletin boards were vulnerable to cross-site scripting, but I did poke around in a few to see which ones put it into the feed. I don't have the results that I could put here. I'll probably post something to like a mailing list or something for, for people who are interested or anybody interested in, in finding out, I can email you it. I'm sorry? Yep. I played around with that a little bit. It pretty much was ignored. <laughs> um, the, the main focus of it was kind of the common elements, um, like the link, the title, the description, the author, the, t the speed title, the speed link, a couple things like that. I did do initial, some initial smoke testing with that, and this is something I'm going to kind of expand on. But um, I didn't find any things off the bat on the, initial, on the initial smoke test that I had done with that. Anybody have any additional questions? or? Well, when I, when I first created it, I thought to myself, I thought, you know, this is lame. This is putting cross-site scripting in feeds. There's just got to be a lot of stuff on this already. So then I like, just made a couple of feeds, and like almost everybody I tested was vulnerable. And I went, well, if everybody's vulnerable, I guess nobody's talked about it. So I started Googling around, and I couldn't find anything, really. I found like the one Yahoo thing. I actually started this in like September of last year, and I just kind of forgot about it for like six months or so. Um, but initially, I thought it was pretty lame. And I just kind of, was, I, I thought, oh, this has to be known. And I, some of the things that kind of surprised me were specifically were the, a lot of the, some of the readers that would load it within a local zone. And it's like, there's no need to do that. You know, a lot of readers were kind of, are, are, read, are, are displaying it within that site contact zone. But these ones are choosing to do it locally. So now they're opening up all this functionality. Yes, the user has to click on the ActiveX in this particular application. It hasn't stopped people before. Um, we wouldn't have email viruses that are using attachments if that was the case. So... Definitely one of the more interesting things um, is when you're displaying the, 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 the feed on a website or putting that, that feed's content into another feed. There's definitely a lot of potential for some interesting things there. As an example, I mean, you guys are familiar with, with, with there are web-based worms now that are starting to use Google in order to find hosts. What if I, was, what if I posted a, a worm or something like that into a blog? Anybody subscribed to that blog executes JavaScript 
And in that particular application, is an, just to make it easy for the sake of the discussion, it's within the local zone. Well, now you have that JavaScript start searching for other hosts running that software and start posting copies of itself. And now whenever somebody reads that feed, now it does the same thing. So there's definitely a potential here um, for, for worms and things like that. Um, I haven't seen any. I know people are going to ask me uh, how many real life examples of this have I seen. Um, a lot of the smarter people are not going to be noticed. There have been uh, two instances with Google and Yahoo where um, there have been some issues discovered, and I'd be naive to think that 10 other people hadn't thought of this before me and just hadn't said anything, because that's what ha it happens all the time in the security industry. People, people write something, oh, it's so cool. Oh, yeah, I was doing that three years ago. You know, it just happens all the time. Nice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the potential for, for revenue as far as people people subscribing to online um, advertisers, like like as an example, yeah, it's the only one that I know of that has ads in our in RSS or Atom feeds in particular. But definitely, there's a potential for people to start abusing that and, and just posting it all over the place, kind of like those spam bots do on web forms, in order to try to generate revenue or do SEO boosting or things like that. Anybody have any additional questions or? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's hard to hear you. Yes. Yes. I kind of do the common type of filtering, like associated with like cross-site scripting as an example. What I did was I basically stripped things like double quotes, left bracket, right bracket, parentheses. I, I even stripped pound and ampersand and semicolon out of there before I presented that information to the user. Common cross-site scripting filtering applied to this. Do we have any additional questions? Yes, they were extremely well with responding. I contacted them and they had this thing fixed very quickly. Yep. I was actually very pleased by that because as people here know, you contact vendors, you might be waiting a couple of years maybe. <laughs> but they were they were real fast turned around. Which I was pleased. Which particular issue, the unmasked over one or something else? They just fixed that within the last month for the for the for the particular issue I'm talking about. Definitely it's possible that some other things have been discovered in there. So any additional questions? Okay, thank you.